assume, and none of you would ever assume when somebody starts talking that they have any prior knowledge about you. So all I'll do to start us off is just run through my career for the last... 30 years, isn't that awful? 30 years. Uh, and then I would love to take some questions from you, or we could just talk about all the things in journalism that are interesting at the moment, uh, and that will probably take us through. How long have I got, actually, Tim? Oh, well, you've got as long as you like. I've got to go and teach at two. Most of these guys are in class at two. Oh, OK, God, no, we're not going to go and... Yeah. Oh, God, no, we're not going to do an hour, are we? I think... No. We're not going to do an hour. I think we're probably going to do 45 minutes at the very, very most. Um, uh, so I started out at the University of Kent many, many years ago in 1987. Uh, I did a degree in classical civilization and Ooh. philosophy. Is that what you did no, too? I have your history oh, okay, okay. So uh, I think most people assumed that there was no employability in that degree at all. Do you have the same kind of thing going on? Yeah. Anything in humanities, you know, uh, twas ever thus. But I loved the degree. And I'd always wanted to work in radio, which essentially came from a very isolated childhood in rural Hampshire, uh, where we didn't have a television, uh, but we did have a 40-mile drive to school every day, uh, where my mother's only concession to the fact that she had children was to allow us to choose the radio station. So we always chose Radio 1, which back in the day had monoliths like Mike Reed doing The Breakfast Show. Uh, I wouldn't say that he's one of my all-time radio greats. Do any of you even know who he is? Yeah. Yes? You do? Okay. I think he's... Frankie Goes Hollywood record on air. Yes. And he's, I think he's more famous now for his quite, to the right of centre, conservative views, particularly about immigration. Anyway, we'll park him there. Uh, the radio was just this most extraordinary kind of warmth that came into our incredibly dull lives in, you know, 1980s Hampshire. So I'd already decided by the time I went to university that that was the great big thing I wanted to work in. Had no specific idea about how to really get there. And while I was at university, I read about the trainee reporter scheme, <laughs> uh, of which that's just so extraordinary. Um, the TRS is still going at the BBC. It's one of lots of schemes. You've probably looked into them yourselves already, but it's specifically aimed at local radio. And whilst I was at UKC, I decided that local radio was exactly the place that I wanted to be in. So I did that thing, which you're all probably busy doing at the moment. I completely tailored my experience and my CV to suit that course. Uh, I think that is important to do, really important to do. If I had done that kind of scattergun effect of trying to get on every single thing, uh, I probably wouldn't have got a place on any of them. But the TRS asked for very specific things here, didn't it? Uh, and you had to have this kind of passion for your local community um, and essentially you know that's the basis of all good journalism. So I did the TRS, got sent to Hull, Somerset and Northampton, basically because she didn't like me very much, because those were not the great postings. They, 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 so. they were the plum jobs. No, but it, uh, to be fair, you were sent to places that you had no previous connection to, so you were absolutely thrown in at the deep end, which was quite a painful thing. We were all very young at the time, but also an extremely good thing, you know, way of really finding your feet. Uh, I went back to London, went to GLR. Uh, GLR was in its heyday. It had this extraordinary lineup of people. So Chris Evans was there, Danny Baker, Emma Freud, Gary Crowley, Tommy Vance, Johnny Walker. It was just an incredible, incredible place. Uh, and I started out as a reporter working for free there for a long time. I used to do uh, my normal job at whatever local radio station I'd been assigned to during the week and I'd drive back to London, do free shifts over the weekends, get up at five o'clock, drive back on a Monday morning. Couldn't have been happier. I have no complaints about that at all. Couldn't have been happier. Uh, luckily got offered a job and, and, and then, you know, uh, wangled my way on air and that's kind of where I've sat ever since. Um, I'm so happy to take lots of questions about that time in my life because that's probably the most relevant bit to you. I know that loads has changed, obviously, over the last 20 years. Perhaps it seems that 
when people like me, I'm nearly 50, you know, when we came through in our 20s, it was an easier environment. But trust me, it wasn't, actually. And the statistics for the number of applicants for the TRS are the same today as they were back then, which is about three or 4,000 applicants for 12 places. So, you know, I have the probably very similar experiences to the ones that you're having or will have when you leave university. Uh, other stuff that I've done, I was just trying to think of the things that I'm proudest of, because I could do about four and a half hours on all the stuff that I'm really not very proud of. So if we narrow that down, flip the coin over, um, I think for me radio has always been the most exciting medium to be in because no one show is ever the same on a daily basis and no one program that you do is ever the same as the one that you did before you know it's it's a remarkably unformatted medium which means that you can just grow with it you can go where your curiosity takes you and i think for me anyway uh, you can stay quite true to yourself you know the best radio programs, uh, the most successful presenters are always, it's all right, I can project even further if you'd like me to, um, they're always people who hang on to some kind of, you know, original sound, who come out of the radio at you or come out of a podcast at you with something, you know, that really does light your ears up. Um, I think Sunday service on Five Live, which all of you are way too young to remember, um, but it was a groundbreaking program. So it was presented, there were three of us presenting it. Andrew Pierce, who hopefully you'd recognize the name. He writes for The Mail. He does a show on LBC. Uh, he's in equal measures, evil and wonderful. <laughs> uh, Charlie Whelan, who was, uh, spin doctor to the stars uh, and probably one of the laziest but most effective radio presenters I've ever worked alongside. He literally did the program with his feet on the desk <laughs> uh, but he did have an awful lot to contribute. He wasn't afraid of uh, telling it how it was. I embellishments I think happen from time to time but anyway there were three of us in the studio. Uh, it was a show on Five Live and it slightly debunked the, not the Westminster myths, because nobody can do that, but I think it allowed people an access to Westminster and all the behind the scenes kind of gossip and stuff. The other programs had always liked to rather dress up in that, I know a secret, but I'm not going to share it with you. And actually the, the total MO of that program was we've got lots of secrets and actually we are going to tell you. And so it allowed a really, a, I think a much better, funnier, livelier and sometimes more challenging conversation about politics than we'd heard on the radio before. Uh, I mean, it's much imitated now. None of that probably sounds any great shakes to you, but actually at the time, you know, which was nearly 20 years ago, it was very rare to hear people talk, you know, in that Westminster gossip way that we sometimes even now see on the 10 o'clock news, you know, Laura Koonsberg will say, sources close to me have said, and then she'll tell us something that we wouldn't otherwise know if she wasn't there. But that, you know, that has taken a long time to happen. Westminster was a super sealed bubble of people, you know, who had been invited in for a very long time. So Sunday service was grand. That was fantastic. We did a late night show on Five Live as well. Uh, which was joyful just because of the time of day. So we went from 10 till 1 in the morning and we called the last hour beyond Thunderdome because <laughs> anything could happen and the management really weren't listening. And of course that's changed now because you can listen to everything, you know, at the click of a button and stuff. But back in the day, if you wanted to hear something that had gone out on the radio, you had to get the rot out, the ROT, and laboriously listen back through to it. So we had a lot of fun on that programme. Um, uh, it was a phone-in program and, uh, yep, it, it, it pushed the boundaries quite nicely. Uh, more recently, I'm immensely proud of being part of Sound Women and I'd really like to talk to all of you about how you see gender in your own careers, whether you consider it to be something that you need to be thinking about already 
whether you think you're going to get paid the same, um, whether you think if you're in management you're going to pay people the same, and all of that kind of stuff. We set up Sound Women because we recognise that actually within the industry, particularly commercial radio, not so much the BBC, which is ironic given the news stories of the last six months, but there was an incredible disparity between what women were paid and actually how women were celebrated and the opportunities that they were given. So we did a survey when we first started, which no one had ever done before, which was across all national radio, uh, which revealed that only one in five voices on air uh, was that of a woman. And that also included all the women who'd been pushed into the sidelines of travel, weather, reading bulletins. So that's just crap. If you think that the listenership is equal, in fact, in, on many stations there are more women listening than there are men, just. It's absolutely crazy to have so little female representation on air. So we started up Sound Women to fight for it and uh, we're, we're getting there but not really because as you know uh, you know when the rich list at the BBC was published you had to go a very very long way down before you found any ladies at all and even further down before you found any women who worked in radio so I would love to hear your thoughts on that because it's really really got to change for you it's a, you know it's appalling appalling uh, that we even still need to talk about it uh, the latest incarnations of programs that I do and then I'm going to stop. Uh, I do My Perfect Country over on the World Service which is a fantastic program where we're trying to build a perfect country using only bits of the world that actually work. And the World Service did a very interesting survey of its listeners about three years ago uh, in which they found that what most people wanted was some kind of more constructive journalism. They wanted solutions-based journalism. So they didn't want to hear about the endless woes of the world, or they didn't want to hear as much about the woes of the world. They actually wanted to learn more about things that were working. So the World Service commissioned us to make My Perfect Country. We're in our fourth series. Uh, it's, it's brilliant, and I think it's a really good example of very balanced, very scrutinizing journalism, but also journalism with real heart. You know, so we start every program by saying, you know, this is meant to uplift you, because in as much as you can look at the world and think it's all falling apart and we're going to hell in a handcart, actually, especially in your generation, there are just millions of people waking up every day going, how can I make it better? So it's a program that really celebrates that. We put all the public policies through, you know, very strict criteria, so it's not just, well, hey, isn't this great? Um, and, and it's really working. We've got a fantastic listenership. Um, and we were invited to open the United Nations uh, Assembly session back in May of last year, which is the first time a radio programme has ever been asked to do that. If anyone from the UN asks you to do that, say no, because although it sounds like a great thing to do, we pitched up there, you know, in the great big assembly with hundreds of people, you know, watching all that kind of stuff. And they told us, they're, they're a wonderful, of course they're a wonderful organisation in part, um, but the way they do media is very different. And our radio shows, 26 minutes 30, as most radio shows are, uh, they told us the night before, in fact, we had to fill two and a half hours <laughs> on the floor of the UN. <laughs> and it was, it was a marathon. One of our contributors uh, really seriously nearly passed out. <laughs> Uh, because he'd flown in from Kampala overnight and had been expecting to do 26 minutes 30. So when he got to 1 hour 45, he just completely lost it. Anyway, uh, so My Perfect Country is, is really fabulous, really, really fabulous. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of that. The Listening Project is amazing. That's what I do for Radio 4. Uh, it is a huge and very ambitious oral history project based on the American Story Corps project where we're recording conversations. Anyone can have a conversation. It's really rare for the BBC to give such a blank canvas to its listeners. We literally have no editorial judgments or control over what's said in the conversations. And we're building this huge archive of modern history just told our way in our words at the British Library. So long may that last. And the very last thing that I do, um, 
at the moment is a podcast with Jane Garvey, who's the host of one of the hosts of Women's Hour on Radio 4. So we do a podcast called Fortunately, uh, which is, we didn't really mean it to be, but it's, it turns out that it's a, it's a moderate hit with perimenopausal women and gay men. So <laughs> if, if that's not you, I don't mind if you've not listened to it, but if you'd like to join uh, our world, I think it's quite funny, just because we talk about all of those things that usually don't get talked about, and certainly for a 50-something woman, there's just shed loads of stuff in my life that I don't hear being talked about on the radio. So, you know, uh, we're podcasting for a very specific generation. Isn't that absolutely typical? <laughs> oh, switch your phone off before you start. So, that's kind of what I do now. I don't really know what it is that you would like to know. I'll answer any questions you have uh, about big things, small things, individual requests, all of that kind of stuff, uh, over to you, basically. Who wants to start? Does anyone listen to Fortunately? Yeah, yeah. Are you perimenopausal? Well, oh, I, sweet pea. Time, my wife. <laughs> yes. Who I'm looking at, she describes herself as perimenopausal, and she regularly uses Fortunately as ammunition against me. Oh, but okay, yes. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I'm not a gay man, my brother's a gay man, but I love it, so perhaps I am perimenopausal. Okay, well, I think in that big Venn diagram of life, actually, there's a, there's a whopping bit in the middle into which, you know, anybody is welcome. And we didn't set out to appeal to, to perimenopausal women, but we just started talking about things that we wanted to talk about, and that's, you know, that's where we are. Did you enjoy the bra debate that you recently had a month ago? Was that, was, that, was that about big bras or fruit and bras? It was we, just about bras in general. And bras in general. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That, that Garvey woman, I love her. Oh, she is, she is blissful. So the bra thing, Jane revealed, um, you know, and bearing in mind, this is a podcast funded by the BBC and put out by the BBC uh, with Radio 4 attached to it. So Jane, um, she described one evening where she found herself with an all too common problem. When she took her bra off, she found a sultana in it and she didn't know <laughs> whether or not she should eat it. <laughs> so we discussed whether or not you should eat things that have been in your bra a long time. Uh, and then we had quite an illuminating conversation as well about, the, about women's changing bust sizes during their life because that happens uh, as well. And uh, she saw fit to reveal what her bust size is. And she's a diminutive poppet, Miss Garvey. And she decided that she wanted to tell all of our listeners that she was a 30G, which is astonishing, isn't it? I mean, this, uh, I, so I said, that's a bit Dolly Parton. It's a bit Charlene Tilton for the older lady in the room. Um, and we got a huge response to that because actually, I mean, it's a tiny thing. It sounds trivial. Maybe it even sounds a bit pathetic. But actually, you don't hear intelligent, so-called intelligent women, you know, who are capable of having a conversation about all of those big intelligent things in life. You don't hear them talking about bra sizes and whether or not your boobs get bigger or smaller as you get older. And the only time you hear bosoms being talked about on the radio is either when they get unwell, which is horrendous, or in a slightly kind of, you know, every pun intended titillating way <laughs> by men so you know it's it's important it's important to have two women talking about the stuff of life just in a normal way without too much fanar fanar going on although i think we probably do fanar fanar a bit there was a heavy element of highbrow fanar fanar <laughs> highbrow fanar fanar yeah, i'm going to use that <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. So if anyone would like to talk about something not to do with bras, obviously yes. happy, yes. yes. I don't have anything to add to the bra. No. Um, the, um, the, the question of pay and, and equality of pay. Yes. Are you sensing change sweeping through the BBC following the publication of um, all of those salaries? No, actually. Uh, so... Um, I think the BBC was surprised that women minded so much about what was revealed 
in the rich list. And I say that with a slightly heavy heart because I think what struck all of us when we read the list and saw how few women were being paid the same as the man who sits opposite them or next to them doing exactly the same job. Did you, did you have no idea? No, you see, we all did have an idea. We all did have an idea, but I don't think, I think what's happened at the BBC and in lots of other media organisations is um, a slight divide and rule kind of HR policy, whether or not it was intended or not intended, has become the norm, where as talent or as uh, editors or senior management, you do not discuss your salary with other people. So I think an awful lot of women thought, I'm probably not paid the same as the blokes, but I don't think anyone really knew for sure. And I think it was that sudden transparency that made people go, uh, you know, shit, this really is a problem, and rightly so. But I think, if I'm honest, and I don't mind this being on tape at all, I think the BBC has been incredibly slow to take on board how serious it is. You know, it's public money, and the BBC should lead the field. And, you know, the, the, they did their own, the BBC did its own uh, internal survey of pay right across the board, including production and auxiliary staff, every single area of the BBC. And they seemed to be thrilled that there was a gender pay gap of 10% as opposed to 18%, <laughs> which can happen in private companies. Now, there's nothing to be proud of in still deliberately underpaying nearly half of your workforce. You know, that is no that you know that that's no salve at all so i think the bbc needs to do a lot more and i think it needs to do it really quickly uh, because it would be absolutely dreadful if we didn't use this you know quite horrible kind of traumatic crash that's happened you know to actually make the workplace an awful lot better I mean, there's a group of us who have been quite vociferous in our response and I don't suspect we're going to shut up anytime soon. So I hope by the time all of you, you know, men and women uh, enter uh, the workforce, you don't have to look across the table and think, you know, there's any kind of disparity at all. It's, I mean, it's shocking, absolutely shocking. If you put, we did a lot of work at Sound Women on this, and just to clarify what the real problem is, uh, if you put, let's say you're paid 10% less than the man who works opposite you, and that only amounts to 400 pounds a month less over the course of a 30 year career, anywhere, but let's just say at the BBC, how much, using compound interest, do you think the woman loses out? I'm happy to tell you, £497,000. So that's a, you know, that's your pension, that's your paying off your mortgage, if you're lucky that's your second home, that's your gift to your children. I mean it's astonishing, absolutely astonishing, that we're still saying, that's all right, don't worry about that, it's just a woman. Dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. Yes. Is Gwyneth Williams doing anything? Is she on board with Sound Women? Uh, so Gwyneth Williams is the controller at Radio 4. Uh, she has done some, she's been helpful towards Sound Women. I don't really understand the hierarchy at the BBC and who actually wields the power. I think we've all been quite surprised to learn that in terms of salaries, um, uh, lots of people at Radio 4 you know, on, on the network that is allowing these programs to be broadcast, it's not necessarily the network who's paying the salaries. So John Humphrey's salary comes out of news, Eddie Mayer's salary comes out of news. What about Montague? Sarah Montague's would come out of news, so but it's the same deal, so same Yes, no no those are the same say. yeah, no, those are the same people. But you know, Jane and Jenny on Women's Hour come out of Radio Four, I'd come out of Radio Four Docs. Uh, you know, they're all separate entities and, um, I mean, I'm, you know, I have no great insight into HR at the BBC, nor do I want to, life's too short, but they, um, but they certainly don't seem to have any very coherent structure and within that 
you know, someone's individually paid and doesn't know this and doesn't know that. Uh, I don't really understand actually where the controllers lie. I'm not. I don't even know whether. Gwyneth is ultimately in control of the whole of Radio 4's budget. I presume she's not. I presume. Yes, no, she was helpful. No, she was helpful to Sound Women. And I mean, I have to say, I like her. You know, whenever I've gone to see her, I found her to be an incredible, uh, incredibly approachable female boss. I wouldn't put her, you know, if I was doing a here are the problems, uh, here are the non-problems, I wouldn't put her as a problem person. I'm, I'm probably not going to list all the, the, the yeah, problem yeah. people. It just seems that she's in such a great position to equalise things at this point in time. Yeah, i tell you who I would like to hear from more, and that's the men at the BBC, because I think it's, apart from anything else, it's just a really toxic environment if you feel as a woman that you're fighting for something that isn't being supported by nice, decent men. Because, you know, n n nobody... Nobody ever said, you know, Michelle and, and Sarah didn't immediately say, I'm not going to turn up for work unless John Humphreys writes me a cheque. You know, that's not what they're fighting for. They're fighting for the person who, who actually decides your pay to not break the law. The Equal Pay Act came in in 1970. So you don't want to create this horrible, toxic environment uh, for, the, you know, for the workforce itself. Um, you know, but I think that men do have to step up and say, you know, I'm I'm on board with this. Why wouldn't I want it to be an equal playing field? I, you know, I would like to, yeah, I'd like to hear, yeah, I'd like to hear more men say, you know, I get it too. Sorry, I won't. <laughs> Not first. <laughs> um, a bit more of a general question, I'd say, about breaking into into the yes. career. I mean, for people who've got families or maybe partners who aren't in the journalism world, like, how would you? Do you have any advice for sort of managing your personal life um, <laughs> while you deal with a regular hour? No. <laughs> I think it's a, re God, it's a really good question. You've just got to have a very understanding partner because aside from anything else, all of the best shifts and the best programs are going to be antisocial. So you're always going to want to head towards a breakfast show or in politics, a weekend show. You know, it is, uh, that's just what's going to happen. The stuff in the middle that happens from, you know, 9.30 to 3.30 to allow you to do the school run is going to be worthwhile and valuable, but it's not going to come with, you know, the showbiz lights attached to it. So I think you just have to be incredibly realistic about your level of ambition. And, you know, Tim will back me up and all of your tutors will, you know, will, will back me up. It's, it's tough if you want to work at the top. So, and I make no bones about this. When I had children, uh, I've got two, they're 10 and 12. When I had kids, I was doing I was doing Broadcasting House at Radio 4 on a Sunday when I had my son. I took maternity leave and came back to do Saturday Live and uh, did two years on Saturday Live, had my second child, came back from maternity leave, did another two years on Saturday Live and actually I'd reached my limit because I'd never ever in 25 years of work had a normal job that was in the week between nine and five. So I'd done weekend breakfast shows, late night shows, breakfast shows, then a Saturday show, then a Sunday show. And actually once my kids were in school and my husband was working abroad a lot during the week as well, that pressure on our family life was just absurd, absolutely absurd. So I gave up what was a very lovely, you know, cherry on the icing on the cake job because I couldn't make it fit around my family life. So I don't regret that choice at all because it, it suited us and I've managed to get back into the workforce and do valuable things afterwards, but not to the same level as I was doing before. So I think just give yourself a reality check and also really, if you don't marry somebody and have kids with somebody or with somebody in the business, then just, ex you know, just be honest about, about what, you know, what, what it's going to be like. Also, if you're working in news, then your on-call 
just all the time. I mean, of course you are. And if you love it, then actually quite a large portion of your brain is just with the news. I mean, it's addictive, isn't it? You can't, and, and why would you not want, I mean, it is, it's a glorious world to be in, absolutely glorious world, but you are quite, you know, focused all the time on that. And I think that can be, you know, that can be quite tough as well, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really like. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I really like playing around with um, sort of quite long form radio documentary style stuff. I've, I've done some stuff in radio, on local radio, not on news, but on presenting. But I really enjoy radio, and I'd like to get into sort of more long form stuff. But like, how would you like fast track your career to get to that sort of job? So I know you can't like entry level in. Yes, I'm going to go work on documentaries and stuff. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's just hard. Actually, that's that's probably the hardest area of all radio to, apart from anything else, make a living yeah. at doing. So, uh, I mean, in terms of, in terms of long form documentaries, realistically, you're looking at, at Radio 4, uh, occasional programs out of Radio 3, but their budget's quite heavily cut these days, or the podcasting world. And to be honest, you, your best bet these days is in the podcasting world. I don't mind sharing figures with any of you at all. I'm even happy to tell you my salary if you really want to know it. Uh, long form documentaries at the BBC at the moment, uh, you're probably still looking at a budget of, you know, between three and 4,000 yeah, for a 26 minute. You might be lucky to be able to push it up a bit more, you know, for a 45 minute documentary so that's you know if you think about the amount of work that you're going to have to put into that uh, it's not great and you can't guarantee the commissions they've also just started a new system called batching where instead of everybody being able to submit an idea for the documentary slots they've now been given in batches to some of the best production companies so you'd have to go in through the production company to, to you know, even be able to secure that commission. So just tough, actually. I think just tough. I mean, it's an, I think documentary making is a, I mean, it's a beautiful way to spend your time and absolutely wonderful, but you've got to be, you've just got to be the most canny, wily person these days to make sure that, that every, you know, that people hear your product as well you know I think that is that is quite difficult it's quite a crowded market audible is good though audible is commissioning a lot of stuff I think they're slightly recently heading towards the we need a big name attached to it you know to get it out there but um, they seem to have a bit more money in the bank and be a bit more willing to you know take a chance on on stuff and also the great thing about podcasting is that it is a global thing so you can approach WNYC in New York with an idea now which you wouldn't have been able to do five years ago and you know they'd, they'd happily take it if it's a great idea so you know all of those barriers coming down but good luck my friend <laughs> would you agree that if you stopped off in local radio these days you might within a few years easily find yourself filling three hours of air time you be playing some records as well and doing lots of phone interviews, but you'd certainly get quite good at doing some kind of long form radio. Yes. Oh, no, 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 uh, definitely. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great experience, though. No, no, definitely, definitely. But that beautiful crafting of documentaries, uh, you know, it's, there is no quick way of doing it, is there? It, you know, it's going to remain kind of labour intensive and quite badly paid, unfortunately, I think. Think. So, so, yeah. um, Fee, you said you very specifically targeted. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going to come back to that. <laughs> um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, sort of batch of various BBC and journalism training schemes now in yeah. different formats to, to, to what they were, and they seem to sort of come and go with the wind. The BBC decides that this would be a really good thing to do this time, and a couple of years later, it doesn't be different. But as far as any of this sort of concern, if they are thinking of targeting a specific, you can still give the advice targeting a specific scheme, as it were, for mm. what they are after. What's the main bit of advice you would give on how to actually groom yourself, if you like, yes. to get onto a specific scheme? Yeah, so, um, so when I was starting out, um, 
you know, of course you're right, there, there just weren't as many courses available. So I think I was looking at an MA at City, uh, the uh, journalism course down at Cardiff. You know, this didn't exist, you know, if only this had existed. Um, there was a commercial scheme that was being run by whoever it was who owned Invicta Radio at the time, and there was the TRS. And I just remember looking across at all of them. There was also the news trainee scheme at the BBC, which just... Yes, exactly. So it was the elite, and, and I remember looking at all of the people who had got on the course, uh, you know, who had gone on to other things, just thinking, that's not me, that's not where I want to end up, so there's no point trying to get on that course. And that had a reputation, I don't know whether it still does, for really only taking, you know, people who got a Fulbright scholarship somewhere or other. I mean, it was just extraordinary. Yes, definitely Oxbridge. Um, so that wasn't for me. So I just really targeted, I needed to earn a wage as well, which was a key thing. I couldn't really afford to do an MA or head off to Cardiff. So the TRS paid, uh, well, it started with seven, didn't it? 7,000 something or other pounds a year. Uh, but it didn't matter, that was enough, that was enough. Uh, so I targeted it so specifically, I, I mean, obviously read through what it was that they expected, but I just imagined, because it was a local radio scheme, what it would be that would make me, you know, that would allow me to talk about my experiences in a local community. So I tailored my work experience to that. You know, I didn't try and write a funny piece of private eye or send something off to the Times or anything else. You know, I worked at my local rag at UKC at the time. I did stuff on UKC radio. I did hospital radio down in Bromley. And, uh, and I just only focused on that. I mean, it was just very specific. And actually, I remember the interview so clearly because you were there and Kevin was there. Um, and and one of the first questions that you asked me was, why do you want to work you know, in, in local radio as opposed to national radio? And I could just answer the question very well with examples of the stories that I'd covered you know, for a local community, being interested by a local community and not having this you know, kind of huge, wide ambition outside. So, I mean, you'll all be doing exactly the same thing and you'll also just be so much better prepared I think than we were. I mean, we really didn't have the, the level of career kind of nudging that you have now or access to the same kind of expertise. But I would just say it's the basics, isn't it? Imagine yourself in the interview. Imagine what it is that the person wants from you and just give it to them. You know, pack away all those huge later in life ambitions or crazy ideas, whatever, and think, what is it that if I turn up on Monday morning, I'm going to do well for this person? Because that's the only thing that the person who's interviewing you is thinking, what are you going to do for me? You know, they don't care <laughs> about your, you know, wider philosophical ambitions or whatever. You're working for them, so just give them what they want. So the other thing that we had to have for the TRS uh, was the right speaking voice. And actually, that was just incredibly important. And I think the BBC struggles to be able to say that now because it's so, you know, you can appear to be saying the wrong thing. You can appear to be saying that you, you know, you want to positively discriminate for a certain type of accent or a certain regionality. But actually, it makes perfect sense. You do need different accents and you do need different regions represented. And your voice just is that, you know, that is the first thing, obviously, that people hear you on the radio. But you could all walk a place on the TRS, honestly. I mean, the equipment that you've got here, the fact that you're doing it as live, you know, that was just, that was just beyond our imagination. You know, we didn't have that kind of kit when we got on the course. So, you know, you're really, you're, you're beautiful propositions for employers because you can actually do the job. You know, when you turn up on that Monday morning, you can do the job for them, which is, you know, which is great and a huge difference. Huge difference. Fee, um, do you have any particular story that stands out from that you've covered? Anything that really sticks to the back of your mind because you either really enjoyed it or it was really challenging? 
Uh, yes, actually, and it's a very recent one. So I made a documentary, long form documentary, badly paid but loved it, uh, on egg freezing. So uh, you'll know more about egg freezing probably than, than I do now, but as a phenomenon, it is changing young women's fertility horizons. And I lived in New York for a little while, about 10 years ago, and it was just at the beginning of egg freezing. There were lots and lots of advertisements on the subway saying things like, take charge of your fertility destiny, have your eggs frozen. And it just seemed like this incredible, you know, new wave of living that you didn't have to worry about, you know, meeting the right person and having children. You could just freeze those little bots shove them yes <laughs> yes I know but really kind of crazy stuff and I remember thinking at the time god that's you know that's remarkable who's doing this should I be doing this you know that was b before I had kids myself and I revisited it as a story last year and met two women who had answered those very advertisements in Manhattan 10 years ago, uh, neither of whom had yet had a child, so the same age as me, and I count myself blessed to have had my children. Um, uh, but, you know, life hadn't worked out so well for them, so they were still counting on those eggs coming good. So we made a documentary for Radio 4 uh, with Georgia and Philippa, uh, one is English, one is American, uh, and just looked at the science behind it, the promises being made, the ridiculous marketing, all of that, and it's actually a very dark story, and if any of you young ladies are thinking about it, use your journalistic now and really look into it, because the promises it makes, uh, I don't think the science or the statistics actually back up as a reality. Philippa and Georgia have not had children yet, and we followed Georgia to, uh, she had recently, with the help of a sperm donor, had her very last egg implanted, and it had failed. So, you know, we read the same advert. We, you know, they went on to do something, and their lives are so appallingly different to what they thought. They thought they were buying this amazing insurance policy and they weren't. And I'm really proud of that documentary. And we got loads and loads of feedback from it. And, you know, lots of women saying, I was thinking of doing this, but now I'm going to think again. And actually, you know, me and the producer, Sarah Cudden, you know, both of us thought we've actually done a, a, a bit of a service here and in fact the um, the BBC liked it so much they're putting out an hour-long version on the world service uh, in about two months time and it'll and, and it will you know it'll become a much bigger story as more and more women take it up here but it was um, it was good I think it was good journalism it was it, it, it we went on a, a journey doing the story ourselves so that will always stick in the mind and also because i just you know my heart breaks for those women absolutely breaks for those women and without being too pompous about it um, there'll be you know times in your lives as journalists when you have an opportunity and it doesn't happen all the time tim does it you know most journalism is not changing lives or horizons or whatever but there'll, there'll be a couple of times when actually you can do something like that because you're just in this amazing position where you can phone people up and just say, you know, what on earth are you talking about? You know, that's wrong. Prove it. You know, you're, you're selling something. It's snake oil. You know, stop it. <laughs> and, um, and this, you know, what, what a great, what a great, great career to have if you can do little bits like that along the way. And it's doing all the little stories that give you the ability to do it. God, totally, totally. And it's, um, you know, you can't underestimate just the power of, um, of just of just learning to get on with people as well you know when you've got a microphone in between you and somebody else because it's quite odd you know you pitch up in people's houses or in their private worlds or they come into your studio and there's a kind of um, I mean you'll know it already there's a slight artifice isn't there when you switch the microphone on you can make somebody nervous or you can make them retreat into themselves or you yourself can find you know that your mind gets a bit befuddled 
you know, you can all kind of slightly start dancing a dance, but actually really good journalism is always an attempt to get at the truth. And the art of particularly radio journalism is to make somebody feel that the microphone isn't on. So they still tell you the thing that's the most important to them. And stories like egg freezing don't work unless you can get someone to just tell you how they feel about that. Because you can do all the fact and the science and the whatnot and challenging doctors. But what, you know, what makes it a story is someone explaining how their life is just completely ruined. But they have, you, know, you have to let them tell you that. Um, and you have to be, you have to have developed through hours and hours and hours and hours of journalism the ability to be that person that people will say, yeah, I think I trust you. Doesn't matter all this equipment's in here. You know, you're going to tell my story for me and you're going to, to do it justice. So. I don't think very many people start out being able to do that. Uh, I think it's a really proper 10,000 hours learning thing, actually. How, how possible is it to sort of go and work abroad doing radio? So I quite like to work in like America or Canada for a bit and come back to England afterwards, but how possible is it to sort of do that? Well, it'll depend on Brexit. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, I think any English speaking uh, country, uh, you know, you don't, you, I, I, I would imagine the opportunities are there too. Um, I mean, American, American, the American audio industry is very healthy. Their radio industry is quite strange and, and, uh, you know, NPR is classically underfunded, and I would imagine you'd be up against thousands and thousands of American youths trying to do exactly the same thing. Um, so I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I lived and worked in Manhattan uh, 10 years ago, but aside from that, I've never, you know, I haven't left the country in the last 10 years, so I'm probably not best placed to to answer that. There are various BBC postings to follow stations. <laughs> Um, NPR has a specific scheme targeted to people not from the US, particularly that feeds into their podcasting, whatever. Um, and CBC takes on British graduates too, especially if you speak French or well English. Interesting. I bet we're not so welcoming here, are we? Um, the BBC takes on a few in the World Service, not very many. Yeah. Um, OC students. And obviously European Union citizens can get jobs. Yeah. Well, European Union citizens do. Mm. And Actually, our commercial broadcasts are more than one, in my experience. Um, <laughs> no, it all depends on Brexit, doesn't it? Yes. Um, yeah, I think commercial radio is really open to, to European voices. The problem when you're not from Europe is, is visa regulations and the, the minimum requirements to sponsor to someone to give them a visa. Most first entry journalism jobs will yes. fit them in yeah. terms of the hours that you're supposed to do or the salary that you're supposed to get. So it's not impossible when you're further up your career, but as a first entry level job it's a bit harder. Yeah. Not impossible, just a bit harder. Yeah. And I think the, the World Service is quite deliberately uh, sending fewer people out to postings and trying to employ more people on the ground in the territories where it's broadcast and you know about time too <laughs> really so yeah. you know yeah I was talking about that exactly about that. <laughs> yes how's about that <laughs> yeah yes 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 um, going back to the gender pay gap yes I'm wondering what you and the other sort of senior women at the BBC what your campaign is going to be based on going forward do you think your best Ooh. options are well uh, so there are a couple of things that I can't tell you about but there is but there are things you know coming up November the 10th is equal pay day so November the 10th is uh, is the classic day uh, by which uh, every day after November the 10th women in this country work for free because the because of the pay gap so we've got some things planned <laughs> coming at, coming at you. Oh, would that be no women on the radio that day? Or? No. Um, uh, do you know what? Strike, it's strike action and walking out is, uh, is the ultimate, isn't it? Absolutely the ultimate. And um, I think, I don't think we're at ultimate stakes yet at all. Um, there are some really hefty negotiations going on at the BBC and, you know, all broadcasters. The NUJ's 
being amazing. Uh, equity is being amazing. Uh, I don't know much about Beck too, but I imagine that, that you know they're on it too. Um, so all of that is you know pushing forward. Um, I think our campaigns, you know, they will get more sprightly and they will get more visible if things don't change quite soon. But also the BBC has a deadline at the end of the year uh, by which it will have completed all of its internal audits. They're doing a special talent review, uh, which sounds like a great show you can buy tickets for, but it's not. Um, so, you know, I think it's beholden... Uh, for us to hold back until they actually report and say what the plan is before we go completely crazy. But there is nice stuff, I hope, coming on November the 10th. And in fact, we were gonna try and do, I don't know whether, have any of you seen the ABC 343 film? Oh, you've got to watch it. Do one thing today, just type it into YouTube. So the women at ABC in Australia, uh, they made this amazing film called 343 because again, 3.43 is the time at which every woman can knock off and go home because she's not paid for the rest of the working day. Um, and they've done it brilliantly. It's a song and dance routine. It's really fantastic. It, and, and it stays with you. And it gets the point across. And, you know, all hail to them. And I suppose, you know, we will try and do more things like that and actually the BBC has rectified some salaries already but I think the point you know the letter that we all the open letter that we all signed to Tony Hall back in the summer uh, there were two really two really important things in it one is a recognition that we're talking about people breaking the law so it's not an airy fairy oh but women have children and you know all of those type of things it's breaking the law to pay somebody for doing the same job less so you know, end of all the whatever lifestyle chat you want to have around it. Just stop breaking the law. And the second thing was that we're doing it. We're, you know, we wrote the letter. We're making a fuss about it because people further down don't have the opportunities that we have. So um, most of the press chose to ignore that and have, and have subsequently portrayed anything that we've tried to say or do as being a, you know, a bunch of overpaid you know, privileged women, you know, carping on. And it's not that. We are doing it because we know that there's a gender pay gap all the way down. And also because if we can get paid so wrongly, then of course other women are getting paid so wrongly. You know, if you look at people and you think, oh, I can get away with it, and they're your on-air talent, then of course you're trying to do the same thing further down the line. So we have tried to make those points all the way through. And we must you know, make sure that whatever it is that we do, uh, those people who aren't as vociferous or perhaps as comfortably off as we are, are happy with it as well. But yes, watch the space. Hello. When you were, when you were just starting out, did you feel intimidated or inhibited speaking to uh, older people, particularly ones that were very successful in their field? And if so, did, you have any, did anybody give you any good advice about how to overcome that? Yes. So, um, I mean, the short answer is no. I, I never did, actually. And I think... Um, oh, I don't know why, really. Just being a bit short and a bit arsy and not... I don't come from a very elite place, so I think that helps sometimes. You know, if you do, you know, it's not like I'm going to offend someone who knows my parents. You know, it's really <laughs> unlikely. Uh, so, no, I never really did. I really always quite enjoyed that challenging authority thing and and I think you know I hope you hear it more and more you know from younger journalists you know and you should never be intimidated you know you're there to do a job I mean it doesn't you know and and you've got the you've got the power you've got the tape recorder you're asking the questions anything that comes back at you you know these days you can just uh, you can just put it up on YouTube, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, you know, it's a great time to be a journalist, great time to have the recorder on. Uh, so, but, but no, I have to, no, I've never been particularly intimidated. <laughs> I was laughing. I've never been. So I had this terrible incident. Do you remember this at Grafton House with Geoffrey Archer? So Geoffrey Archer... <laughs> 
uh, was being trained, we, we did our training at Grafton House, was being trained to stand in on the Jimmy Young show and he was doing some stuff in the next door studio and we were putting out a, you know, pretend Radio Grafton program as part of our training course and either Sarah or Kevin, uh, the other trainer, said, oh, you know, why doesn't someone pop along and just do a quick interview with Jeffrey because he's in the building. So I got volunteered to go and do it mm -hmm. and that day the Sun had done this kind of spoof thing where they'd put lots of authors writing through a new computer program that had come out that assessed the intellectual kind of capacity of people's writing and Jeffrey Archer's had come out bottom as being less grammatically correct and more offensive than the Sun's editorial usually was. So I thought, what a great question! So I march in there to multi-millionaire best-selling author thinking, oh, you know, cocky me, cocky me, I've got this great question lined up for you. And I asked him the question and he looked at me with that terrible smile. Um, and I thought he was going to, you know, play along with it. And then he just absolutely let rip at me. I mean, absolutely let rip at me. How dare you come in here? And I say, do you realise how much money I earn? Do you realise, you know, how much... I mean, just really, you know, it really upset him. It really upset him. And, and it was the first time that anyone... That it, had, that it had gone really badly wrong, you know, trying to be cheeky and all of that type of stuff. And I felt the tears <laughs> coming up behind my eyes. I just remember thinking, don't cry, don't cry. So I kind of wrapped it up and you know and went away but it was quite a good lesson because you you know I, I judged the situation wrongly and actually I probably could have got away with it if I'd been more respectful of him and uh, you know kind of warmed up to it and and I think he was right to say you know I don't need some cocky young what's it coming in here and saying this that and the other.